Well, thank you all for having me. And um, of course, you know, I'm meteorologist David Kelly from Six News. And uh, I will preface this by saying that most of the time I'm giving these sort of presentations, I'm talking to third graders. So, <laughs> if so much you, you still are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we won't disappoint you. Yeah. You sit on the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> If, if, it, if it seems too simple or it seems like it's really common sense, I apologize, but hopefully we can learn something here. And if you don't learn anything, ask me questions until, some, until you do learn something. So, of course, we're, we're talking about uh, outdoor weather safety and, you know, particular lightning because of that unfortunate lightning strike that happened last year. And uh, so we want to kind of break down what causes thunderstorms, lightning, how do you stay safe from lightning when you're outside and Perhaps more importantly, how do you plan around it? Because the best way to stay safe is just to know that it's coming, because then you can get out of the way. Um, of course, that's our weather team at Six News. Rusty Lord, he's been our chief meteorologist for a long time. Um, Emily Roller joined us a few years ago. Jane Steffens just joined us uh, last summer. And uh, Jared Lamsford joined us a couple of years ago. So Rusty and I have been there the longest at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but of course, you know, this is the type of weather that we want to see. This is what we want to see. Blue skies, sunshine, get out on the trails, get in a good bike ride, enjoy the nice weather. But of course, we know it can quickly go from that to something a little more that. like this. <laughs> uh, pretty much like that here in, uh, in Nebraska, Iowa, really all across the Midwest, we have these huge weather swings and, and sometimes it seems like they just come out of the blue. So really want to talk about what the most dangerous weather is that you're going to face when you're outside. And, um, and that doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily represented by the, uh, the number of fatalities, but I did want to bring this up because heat is generally the biggest weather killer here in the United States. And it's the hot weather during the summer, people don't really realize it's sneaking up on them, and then they you know, succumb to some sort of heat illness, a stroke, or something like that. But the thing that you will, the most dangerous thing you run into on bikes is generally lightning, and that's why we're here talking about that. Uh, it's going to be the most common thing that you're going to have to, you know, seek shelter from. Of course, you know, you have tornadoes, hail, and all that kind of stuff in the Midwest, but that also all comes with lightning. So anytime there's a storm, you're going to end up with that lightning. And, all right, it did that to me last time. Uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, activity that uh, generally has, the, oh, all right then, has the uh, most fatalities when it comes to lightning is... Believe it or not, uh, boating and fishing. So it's not so much your uh, outdoor recreation that uh, tends to have issues like that, but it's the it's uh, like running and biking. It tends to be uh, a lot of water-related activities that have a lot of lightning fatalities. Let me see if I can be get back to where I was and see if it doesn't do that again. Wow. Okay. It's got a tough spot in there. <laughs> when I was doing it earlier. <laughs> That's technology for you. Yeah. I will just go ahead and stick past that and see if it continues to work after that. What, can, can I ask you something? Is, sure. why, is it because nothing else is around for it to, to strike and you're the only thing? Uh, in terms of the, the lightning, strike lightning on the strikes on the water? Uh, that's probably part of it. Um, is there a video there? Or? Yeah, there is a video there. And it looks like it's not, not finding it. Doesn't want to play it. Hmm. That day, there really wasn't any lightning at all. And there really wasn't any real mean looking clouds even that day. But there was one lightning storm. <laughs> 
Oh, is that right? There was quite a bit. It was in Glenwood. I was over there. It's pouring and thundering. Tonight? No. Oh, that day. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to see if I don't skip those slides. And keep going. <laughs> skip the bad one. <laughs> um, what I was trying to show you was that the, the, the activities that have the most lightning fatalities are it's boating, fishing, and then soccer and golf. Um, wow. I know that cycling has its own category because I, I, you don't really hear about that all that often, but I think it gen generally gets lumped in with other outdoor sports. But in terms of where those occur, Florida, Georgia, and Texas have the most lightning-related fatalities every year. Uh, in the last decade, Nebraska has had one, and Iowa has had two, while Florida and uh, Texas have had on the order of uh, 50 to 60. I don't remember the exact wow. number there. Wow. Um, I would like to think that's because here in the Midwest, we respect the weather a little bit more, but it probably has to do with more along the lines of those big coastlines on those states and the fact that they have a whole lot more people. Yeah. yeah. Um, but over the last you know, 20, 30 years, the number of fatalities from lightning strikes has been decreasing at a pretty steady rate. And um, National Weather Service and other you know, research agencies I believe is because of the, the, the amount of outreach that they've been doing, the amount of literature and the, the amount of um, information that we've been able to get out to people and the fact that people are more informed for the most part when it comes to the weather so that they are able to get out of the way. At least that's what we hope. Um, better prediction? Basically. Yeah, better yeah. predictions, things like that. However, I want to you know, talk about the fact that only about 10% of people that are hit by lightning actually die. The other 90% end up with you know potentially life-changing injuries, and you know that is a huge deal in and of itself because right. you know it can completely change the way you have to live your life and yeah. you know, perhaps prevent you from riding your bike ever again. And so we want to prevent that from happening as well. Mm -hmm even though most lightning strikes aren't actually fatal, at least here in the United States. So a little bit about you know, where does that lightning come from? So for the most part, we have these big, large, we call them cumulonimbus, you've probably heard that uh, term before, thunderstorms, and there's a lot of energy in those storms. There's a lot of wind moving things around, and so you get the water droplets, you get the hailstones, you get little ice crystals, all of that's getting bashed against each other round and round inside that storm, and it builds up a static charge, just like you do when you scoot across the carpet when the air is really dry. And it builds up a <laughs> really large static charge. Apparently none of my videos are gonna work, so that's cool. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it builds up that really large static charge, and once it gets to a certain point, that charge is large enough that it's able to jump from the cloud to the ground. So you think when you go over and you touch the doorknob and you get that little spark between your hand and your, the doorknob, you're not actually touching it when that electricity makes the little arc right there. And you can feel that little jolt when that happens. That's how much charge it takes to make that little jump. So you think about how much electric charge it makes, takes to make the jump from the cloud all the way to the ground, and that's why lightning becomes then so, so dangerous. There's several different types of lightning, and I'm just gonna show you a picture of it, but I don't think it's gonna show up. Um, half the strips around here are ground cloud. Who, who can tell me you know, maybe what, what some of those different types of lightning are off the top of your head, anybody? Heat cloud. lightning. Okay, so heat lightning is... Cloudy cloud. Not a type of lightning. <laughs> um, it is lightning, but it's it's lightning that's so far at the distance you can't see the cloud that it's in. Um, did ball, say ball lightning. Ball lightning. Yeah, that is a, a type of lightning. I've never actually seen it, but it it, it, uh, it exists, and um, I would uh, certainly like to see it one day. We have um, also uh, what we call cloud to ground, so that's those big bolts that you see from the cloud, jumping from the base of the cloud down to the ground. 
cloud to cloud, so that's inside of the thunderstorm. And then we have um, cloud to air, where the lightning starts inside of the thunderstorm and actually shoots out the side. And that can turn into one of the most dangerous types of lightning strikes. And those are, um, we call them, as meteorologists, they're positive lightning strikes because they start from the top of the cloud and they build a positive charge. And because it's traveling from the very top of the cloud all the way to the ground, it has an enormous charge with it, also known as the bolts from the blue. Those are the types of lightning that can travel up to 10 miles from the storm. Now, this is playing off of YouTube, so that's why it's maybe working. <laughs> so there you can see in this particular thunderstorm a lot of examples of that lightning shooting out the side of the thunderstorm. So it doesn't just go up or down, it doesn't go to the ground, it doesn't go from another cloud, it completely shoots all the way out the side of the storm. And then in other cases you can see that lightning actually arcing from the top of the storm down to the ground a good distance away from where any rain or hail might be. So like there in that case you can see the lightning shooting way wow. off to the side of the storm. So one of the things that we always say is if you can hear thunder, you're close enough to be hit by lightning. And that's why, because not all of the lightning stays inside of the storm. It can travel a really far distance outside of the thunderstorm. And those are the bolts that are the most dangerous. Those are the bolts that are typically powerful enough to uh, kill anybody that they, they hit, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, it's kind of cheesy, but the National Weather Service has this slogan, when thunder roars, head indoors. And, you know, because you, you can hear that thunder, you're probably close enough to be hit by lightning. And storms generally don't move all that quickly they can, but they're not usually moving that quickly. So. If you can hear thunder, it's it's close enough that you could be hit, and it's probably going to be close enough for a while, so you need to give that storm time to move away. So they come up with that 30-minute time window that everybody at the pool hates. <laughs> um, but you have to give that storm time to get far enough away that that lightning risk is coming down so that it, it's not going to arc out of the storm and hit you, even though it seems like it's far, far away. So, you know, what do we do trying to get ready for a, a, maybe a big bike ride or just, you know, any, any, any ride, any day? Just keep up with the forecast. That's the best way to stay informed. Is there a chance for storms today or tomorrow or three days from now? Uh, if there is, you know, keep visiting that forecast and, and check the points along whatever route you're doing. If it's a 10-mile route, you probably don't have to check every point, but if you're going on a big 60, 70 mile bike ride, you're going to check the forecast at both ends of that ride to make sure it's, it's looking good. There's, there's a lot of ways you can check in on that forecast. Of course, I'm going to you know, vote for you know, check in with us on TV. Um, <laughs> and for the most part, when you check in with a, a local meteorologist on, on whatever media outlet you want to look at, it's probably going to be a good forecast because that's their job to forecast for that particular area. Uh, you can use weather apps, but um, I want to caution on those because especially the, the generic ones, the, the ones that come on your phone, the ones that come from AccuWeather or the Weather Channel or things like that, the forecasts in those apps are built by computers. The forecasts on, on our apps are from us. Unfortunately, it's only for Omaha, so if you are somewhere outside of Omaha, then your best bet is probably to go to the National Weather Service. And they have, you know, offices all over the country <coughs> building that forecast every single day. So it's a forecast made by a person, not by a computer. And that's generally going to be a little bit more accurate than just those computer-generated forecasts. Those can be helpful, but they're not always going to be quite as accurate <coughs> as perhaps one that's been looked over by a person first. So you, you can watch us on TV, you can download our app. Um, you don't have to download our app, you can download whoever's app that you want, but don't tell my bosses I said that. <laughs> um, and then if you go to the National Weather Service, you'll see that forecast there, and pull this over. Just 
and you can get a forecast for pretty much anywhere in the country. You just go to this their website, which is weather.gov, and you can click on the map anywhere you want to go, and they have point forecasts for anybody. So if you want to go out to Columbus, there's the forecast they have, and if you want to look at uh, a chart for like the entire day, they have that forecast there. It, you might have to study it a little bit to to uh, okay. figure out everything there. <laughs> That's in that that particular forecast, but this part is pretty easy. You can just kind of scan it through and see. Well, there's a chance for showers tomorrow, but the rest of the week looks like it's going to be dry. You know, when I'm out riding, I use I rely on radar scope. Yeah. I've got the, the paper, and that seems to be pretty good because I've got um, where I can detect lightning and stuff like that. So uh, the thing that I see a lot of time is a lot of the radar and stuff. It's the same radar I use off a of radar scope. Some of the local stations will use yeah. for yeah. their radar. So. Yeah. And um, that's you know part of you know staying staying aware, staying weather aware on when you're out on that ride. So you, if there's a chance for storms, and you know that, you go out and you can see the sky is clear, and you start your ride. Make sure you have a way to stay up to date on the weather. Make sure you have a way to get weather alerts, whether it's about severe weather, whether it's about lightning from an app or something like that. Check that weather radar. To, to make sure your route is clear. And if you see some storms on the radar, try to you know, see which way they're moving, how quickly they're moving, if they're moving toward your route. And if they are moving toward your route, then maybe you delay starting until they pass by. And if you're already out on the routes, keep an eye on the sky, watch for those dark clouds, things like that. And if you hear the thunder, then you know it's time to probably take shelter. So checking on the radar, you mentioned radar scope. Yes, that is a, a good app. Um, it is a paid app, but it gives you the uh, the high resolution radar. Uh, a lot of uh, national weather apps, the built-in weather apps, even our weather app, have what's called a composite radar, which is good. You can see anywhere in the country on it. But the uh, the radar scope and radar Omega, my radar, these are apps that will show you your local radar site so that you can get a better resolution on the storms, get a better idea which way they're moving. Unfortunately, they're not all free, but if you want a good radar app, those are what I would recommend. The only weather app that I have on my phone is RadarScope, because that's what I use to track you know, rain as it's moving through the storms. I've been watching the thunderstorms down in Kansas City because my parents have been under a tornado watch this evening. So. Mm. I've been using that to keep track of them. And it gives you your location. Uh, it kind of looks like that. It shows you where you are on the map. really have so many radars, so I mean, they're not yeah. all, unfortunately. It's probably like, you know, one every so many hundred miles, right? Yeah, there's a, about 120 or so across the country. Yeah. Yeah, so they don't cover everywhere equally, unfortunately. But we have one here in Omaha, yeah. so it covers the city, the metro area, really, really well. Yeah, I like it also shows up, you can switch it to hail mode to see if you got some of that coming up. Yeah. And then I know it's about my radar. It, that picks up the lighter rain a lot better than the radar scope. If there's a, like today we had a light drizzle, my radar doesn't, our radar scope doesn't pick it up, but my radar does pick up that. If you go into the advanced settings and change the color table, it does. <laughs> yeah. well, you have to show me yeah. that. <laughs> um, you know, when you're out on the right, you check the radar, you see there might be something off in the distance, you go ahead and start your ride. Just keep an eye on the clouds. If you're seeing those wispy cirrus clouds on the side there, those are generally considered fair weather clouds, you're probably in the good. You see some of these puffy cumulus clouds, generally also considered fair weather clouds. Probably not going to have any issues from those, but if they start getting taller, they start getting darker, you start getting the uh, cumulonimbus clouds there. That's when you just want to, you know, start paying attention. So I think, well, maybe I do. I need to turn around. Do I need to, to end the ride early? Something like that. Um, you know, this is what they look like from a distance. As they get up a little bit closer, of course, they'll start to look, kind of obscure the sky, so you won't be able to see all of the features. But uh, you know, I'm I'm guilty of going on a ride and then getting you know surprised by a, a storm. Um, does anybody ride uh, to the Bike MS ride in Kansas City? No. Past. Okay. All right. So, so bike MS is the biggest ride that I do every year. And um, last year, 
we uh, started the ride, and there was a, uh, a storm that wasn't supposed to be there out west of Lawrence, Kansas. And we started the ride, and I was looking off to the west, and I saw those cumulonimbus clouds out in the distance, and I was like, well, that doesn't look good. <laughs> we, we kept riding because, you know, the ride had started. Everybody was out on the course. There was almost a thousand of us out there. And uh, it just kept getting closer and closer. And, and at some point I was like, okay, I was talking to my dad. We, we got to stop. This is coming at us. We got to stop. And um, uh, it, it kind of rolled on over us. You know, that's a, the approach. You can see what's called a, the, the anvil. So the, the, when you see the, the top of the thunderstorm spreading out like that, kind of hits the, the, the top of the <coughs> unstable part of the atmosphere and start to spread out. Um, have you seen a blacksmithing anvil? Yeah. You know? yeah. So that's where it gets that name because it has that shape as the, the updraft, the cloud, hits the top of the unstable part of the atmosphere. It begins to just spread out. And so that kind of gives you an idea of which direction the, the storm's moving. And if that is spreading your direction from the thunderstorm, it's probably moving in your direction. And uh, it starts to look like that. You get those little waves in it, the modest clouds, they're called. That'll be a, a sign that it has some pretty intense um, activity, a lot of uh, turbulence in it. What were those called? Animals? Yeah, no, the, uh, the, the modest. modest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, this part of the cloud can actually help to spread the lightning out ahead of the thunderstorm. So you, that's when you can get those lightning strikes that are 10, 12 miles ahead of the actual rain because the lightning can travel through that cloud and then come to the ground. Way out ahead of the wow. Storm. And you'll see those clouds kind of getting darker and lower and lower as it gets closer to you. That, I heard somebody say shelf cloud. There's your shelf cloud right there. Yeah. That's usually the leading edge of gusty winds, the heavier rain. If you're talking about a severe thunderstorm, that's probably the, the leading edge of where you'll see those really strong wind gusts that are blowing down trees and things like that. And then right over here, you can see a rain shaft perhaps even a hail shaft right there, so that it's harder to see on this TV than it is on my computer, but you can see there's a mm -hmm. sharp line right there where it goes from, you can see the clouds to just a gray, kind of gray obscured area. That's that rain shaft. So that's something you're gonna to try to avoid, but obviously this is coming at you. This is from the Bike MS ride. Wow. Um, uh, you're going to want to try and find somewhere to, to shelter. So there's really nowhere that is a safe spot when you're outside in a thunderstorm. How's the so, shelf? Go ahead. So do you do you go for a ditch? You don't go for a tree. Right. Right. What? Just what? Nothing to do. Uh, we're getting there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here past. So how, sorry, he's had his hand up. Yeah. The question is just the day. We had our incident that was on that was September 16th, yeah. And our ride was starting at eight in the morning, so it's like it's just kind of just overcast. So we didn't have like those telltale signs of what a whole no. day when energy and yeah. stuff built. Because I was riding with Bonnie, we were just coming through the, the Baxter Arena gate, and suddenly it was like that was lightning. Like, hmm. And that was had a forecast because generally we wouldn't have had 16 people out there. Yeah. thinking about going right so it's like that morning just gave us is there something different we need to look at when it's that morning right because that tends to be a lot longer saturday morning ride um you know i don't i don't remember that day in particular but um there are you know situations where you don't always get a, a really well-defined thunderstorm yeah, thunderstorm line like, there was no black yeah. clouds just, everything was kind of uniformish yeah yeah it was. It was uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, in that situation, there is not a whole okay, lot right. that you can look at and say, oh yeah, that's a thunderstorm. Yeah. That's a situation where you kind of have to use radar or, or something yeah. like that to see what it looks like. Because I think we were hitting the Zarvin right around 845. Yeah. And it's right. like, what? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's when you, you check the forecast right before you leave, and, then, and all of a sudden there's a chance for storms that wasn't there before you go, oh. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Go ahead. So, the difference between a shelf and a wall cloud, wall will go all the way up, though, right? Is that, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah. We have lots of wall clouds. <laughs> um, so, so the, the shelf cloud is usually on the front of the storm. Sure. So, the, the rain is pushing that shelf cloud forward, <coughs> the wind is pushing that shelf cloud so forward. They look like they're rolling. Yeah, it can be called roll clouds, things yeah. like that. Um, so the, the wall cloud. 
has the rain kind of ahead of it. Yeah. It's at the back of the storm. Okay. They do look very similar. Sure, sure. Okay. And almost every thunderstorm, we get a shelf cloud that gets called in as a walk-off. Um, you just kind of learn where it is in the storm, and that's the best way to tell the difference. Okay. There's a head of rain there behind me, right? Oh. A question for my education view. Uh, I started riding this year with some of these guys, and some of them are pretty crazy. <laughs> and they ride during the winter time. And yeah. So, <laughs> uh, are there times of the year that uh, we are more susceptible or for uh, lightning? Uh, in the winter, uh, it doesn't seem to be much, I, my observation. I mean, so, uh, are there seasons of lightning? Uh, um, we we can have lightning any time of the year, but it's definitely more common in March, April, May, June when we have our severe weather season. Um, but we have frequent thunderstorms all spring, summer, and fall long. So the only time we don't have frequent thunderstorms is in the winter. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's one of the one of the hardest things when you're out there riding is those the, those popcorn storms that out. all of a sudden because I've been on rides they'll pop up out of nowhere yeah. like over you mm -hmm. and they'll dump you get some lightning and then they're gone. Yeah, I mean they they don't roll anywhere they're just like there. Yeah, but, and that's always that's always tough because you you, you you know like the forecast will go radar there's nothing there. So yeah. what happens then? Well. What we did was this guy opened up his garage and let us all pile on in wow. and get out of the storm. There was probably 50 of us hanging out in his garage for about an hour and a half while he waited for the storm to, to roll by. Um, I don't see a beer fridge. <laughs> yeah, what's that? Yeah, well, must not have been very hospitable. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the best thing you can do is find somewhere to get inside, but that's not always going to be possible. So if you are caught outside, staying on your bike is not going to help you at all because there's this idea that being in a car, that the tires protect you, being on your bike, well, maybe that rubber on the tires is going to protect you. If you think about it, that lightning is jumping thousands of feet from the cloud to the ground. It doesn't care about two inches of rubber. It's just going to go right on through you. So, so what I hear you saying, David, is always ride with somebody that's taller than you. You know, Dan, that, that day that Dan got hit, he was on the Keystone, and there's high wire towers above the Keystone. But what surprised us all is that it didn't take the route of the, of the wires and the, all of that. Yeah. Those only provide a zone of protection. Yeah. If I remember correctly, it's 35 degrees down on either side. No. Oh. Uh, if you're beyond that zone from the height, I work for the power company. That's. Uh, you can so hear basically, those, you can hear those cables crackling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, that's it's high humidity. Right. right there. But that's Are static. Are you saying there's a zone of protection underneath? Yes. Why? That's why the on around in the Midwest, in the mountains, they don't do it. But in the Midwest, you have a shield wire typically above your transmission and distribution lines. It's always above the actual conductors. That's done, it provides, like I said, a zone, a cone of protection from that conductor down about 35 degrees either side down to the ground. Mm. So it will generally protect the electrical conductors from getting hit and blowing up all the power company's equipment in your house. So what, what that's doing so is... So if you're outside of that cone or zone, it, you, you, know, nothing. you <laughs> don't get any protection. There's, there's you know, pieces of, of metal on the top that help to dissipate the static charge that tries to build up on those tall objects. You don't have that on you, so you don't necessarily and also have there's that. A, either the metal tower for transmission towers yeah. is conducting Correct. it to the, to the yeah. ground. On wooden poles, you'll see an additional copper, copper uh, lead that goes all the way up to the uh, shield wire and it goes to a copper plate that's attached to the bottom of the pole and that's buried three foot under. Kind of a ground there. That, yeah. Is, yeah. that provides right. a ground. Um, yeah, but typical residential area uh, overhead is only 30 foot, so if you take 30 degrees out from 30 foot, you're maybe getting 
20 foot of protection on either side of that. And that's so, what surprised us about Dan that day is that yeah. he, he was on a recumbent. He was even the lowest bike of all of us, too. So. And, and yeah. sometimes... He was riding by himself, so he was, top, he was the tallest. Yeah, well, that's probably true, too. Yeah, yeah. He also had a very uh, chrome-colored helmet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when you think about the tallest object in an area, you, you're probably thinking about everything that you can see around you. But that's not what the electric charge is thinking about. It's thinking about the tallest object right here. And that's, right now, that's me. Over there, he's the tallest object over there. So if the charge is stronger over there, it's going to go up him, even though I'm standing taller than he is right now. So it's wherever that charge is building up, wherever that tallest object is, that's what the lightning is going to go for, unless there's something to dissipate that charge, which we don't naturally have a way to do that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's also about 40% of those lightning strikes are ground to cloud strikes rather than cloud yeah. to ground strikes. Mm -hmm. They've done slow motion studies on it. Most of your lightning strikes is a combination of a discharge feeler coming up from objects on the ground yeah. and feelers coming down from the clouds and when they hit, then you get actual lightning I was I was one of the videos that didn't work that was showing <laughs> the, the, the lightning Maybe. traveling up and That's down why and meeting, sometimes you, you, right. you either uh, smell ozone or you feel yeah. that tingle on your skin when lightning People is there. videos of their hair standing up. You yeah. don't have well, to yeah. worry about that. <laughs> yeah. well, the point being that's probably a ground to cloud feeler yeah. coming up through you. If you feel that or smell that ozone that's when you pretty much want to dive on the ground because yeah. So if you if you if you can't get inside somewhere, um, during severe weather we say don't go underneath the bridges because the wind accelerates under the bridge. But if it's just a lightning storm, you can use one of the the bridges to to go under, or or something like. If you if you have nothing, then You're dead. the best thing you can do is just get as low as you can. And so if you can, you kind of get down and you crouch. And you just roll up on your your toes put your feet close together because if lightning strikes near you that charge can still travel through the ground a few dozen feet and if there's a large difference in the charge from one side of you to the other it's going to travel through you and still shock you so the closer your feet are together the less mm -hmm. of that difference will be but you need to be up on your toes just want to have your feet together yeah. Make yourself a small practice that, Bonnie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, hopefully, hopefully you don't have to sit here for a long time. <laughs> so, do you, uh, do you get away from your bike? Um, you don't have to. Okay. Um, you know, there's <laughs> lightning. You supposedly is attracted to metal, but lightning just goes towards lightning just goes towards whatever is the tallest object. It doesn't care if it's metal, wood, plastic, whatever it is. Um, of course, after the storm, you want to watch out for any post-storm hazards that might debris. happen, like yeah. debris, trees, things like that. Um, and you know, want to briefly touch on anything else that you might see in a thunderstorm or the weather that you're out there. You know, trying to avoid. So this is another reason that you want to avoid it, riding through thunderstorms. Hail. Yeah. Um, the storm that we had on the bike MS ride last fall. Some people decided that they didn't want to stop when the, the course got closed, and they they rode through some hail about that size, and they ended up with bruises on their arms and their legs. Thankfully, they had helmets on, but I imagine that was not a, a, a fun experience. Good so you know when you see that thunderstorm oh when you see that thunderstorm coming at you it's it's not just the lightning that you're trying to get to shelter from because you can end up with stuff like that and you know when that's falling that, that's that's gonna hurt you pretty good. <laughs> um, so there's, there's a question about wall cloud versus shelf cloud. That's shelf cloud. This is a wall cloud. Doesn't look all that different, does it? Mm. But here's how you tell the difference. It's spinning. Oh yeah, yeah. And then tornado. Yeah. Ooh. That's from Lincoln a few years yeah. ago. Wow. This well, is what it looked, there for that. This is what that's, it looked like from the ground. That's a great what video. Where it takes out the, the yeah. chicken shack. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was a good place. Yeah. I, was. I've seen that back in 1976. <laughs> <laughs>
There's that one car right there. Pick up. The chicken still manages to stand up. Yeah. 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 All those people driving around. Get out of there. That chicken just. Yeah. Chickens can't fly. Wow. This is actually a tornado that I videotaped out in um, Kansas. It's out near uh, Lyons, Kansas. Very good ways away from that, but it was a, it ended up being rated an EF4 tornado. So mm -hmm. the one and only time I've been storm chasing, we saw that, and I was like, okay, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> right, now I can say I, can, I did it. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, something else that you may encounter in Nebraska, especially if we keep getting drought conditions, these this dust storm. Um, the term is habuk, which comes from. I believe it's the Middle East. Yeah. Um, I've seen that in Arizona. Yeah. yeah this is uh, last last year. We had a pretty good dust storm kicked up. It was kicked up by a thunderstorm, mm -hmm. but you can see that wall of dust. I think this was out near Columbus, mm -hmm. and uh, it's rolling it across the landscape. Good lord! Wow. The situation here is you, you, you definitely want to get inside because being outside in that. You're going to be breathing in all that stuff, and that's not not ideal. Or you end up with almost no visibility because of the high wind and the dust blowing around. Uh, that's something I have not experienced. And hopefully, we don't have too many more of those around here. As long as the rain keeps coming, it shouldn't be too much of a big deal. Hopefully, this year. Um, you know, and something else that uh, it doesn't necessarily remit uh, isn't a. An, immediate danger it's it's not going to hurt you physically but if you're out riding and you encounter some dense fog and you're just like in a car the low visibility the accidents crashes go up so hopefully you have something with high visibility on you and um, if you can delay your ride i would do that because you get out in that dense fog and you have a car that can't see you yeah the fog itself isn't dangerous but the, that low visibility is right And I always ask this to everybody I do a presentation for. <laughs> What's the difference between a tornado watch and a tornado warning? Do you have, do you have the picture with the, the ta -ta tacos? And I, the I don't know that. Yeah. Yeah. I should put that in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the the ingredients are warning. The watch is the whole taco. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> watch means the ingredients are there. The warning means that the tornado has is, is been sighted or is likely. So you got to kind of take shelter. And that is pretty much it. Hopefully you learned something. If the, not, the weather has right. shifted to where we, we don't have the real violent weather that we've had. I mean, I, I lived here in the 70s, and it was so much better, worse here then. I mean, it, the snow was worse, the tornadoes were frequent, and it was right in Omaha all the time. Now it's kind of... The only dome. Kansas. <laughs> it has, yeah. 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 yeah um, what are the micro, like there's a microburst, it's like a mini tornado that went through, we kind of went through town and here we go. Yeah. I've seen the different places I've been stationed in. Like that Jirachi we had a couple years ago, that was on the trail. Yeah, that just was throw a little bunch of stuff around. And the, like the, a dust devil. Yeah, weird. microburst is that it's sometimes a rain's really pocket of rain spots. falls quickly and drags all the air with it. And then, Reaches 100 miles an hour when it hits the ground. Takes a lot of fence. They have one on base. Anybody have any questions for him? Yeah, anything that was confusing, anything that you need me to clarify, or anything else you want to know? <laughs> what do we need to know when you're riding? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you think of the portable lightning detectors? Uh, I've never actually used one. I've used um, the reason I ask, I just looked one up, actually I just bought one on Amazon. Um, I've used them for photography. Uh -huh. If you're trying to take pictures of lightning, you have to have your camera on bulb and preferably right before the lightning goes off. So they make a little lightning detector that fits on your hot shoe. And those things seem to be pretty damn accurate. Yeah, I, I've never actually used one, but I do know that for the most part they work pretty well. I know, um, a lot of weather stations can have them as part of their like weather stations. I mean, like the backyard. Mine has one. 
yeah. sensor and stuff like that can have those built in. Usually they're they're reasonably accurate. Yeah. Yeah, this one he has is like you clip like it on your belt or something and pager. Yeah, like it's bucks. like a pager and you, it yeah. alerts you if there's. When I worked at a, a pool in Kansas City, we had one like that. Mm. Yeah, a lot of golf courses yeah. and soccer. That's yeah. like the other thing. Do they? Um, mm. Yeah. Interesting. So part of this, that trail everybody uses goes by a couple of golf courses, and I've personally experienced uh, a couple of golf courses when the they have a lightning alarm on there. Mm -hmm. The horn blows. The horn blows. Yeah. Right, kick right, everybody off right. the golf course for half an hour or whatever it is. Yeah. So I, I mean, guess that if you hear one of those when you're driving by. The strike did hit Dan. I mean, it, it. we were on the golf course just fixing the tee off when it hit. And uh, and right after that, they blew the horn. Five minutes after. Too late. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, we went inside as soon as that lightning strike hit. That's that's such a freak accident for sure. Yeah, it's it's really hard because there's no real absolute when it comes to what what causes a certain thing in weather. There's a whole range of conditions where you can get lightning. For the most part, you're going to see lightning and you know stronger storms with heavy rain and 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 all that stuff, but. You can have snowstorms that have lightning in them. Yeah. It's pretty rare, but anytime you have a lot of violent motion in the clouds, you build up that static charge and you can get, get lightning. And unfortunately, you know, sometimes the gray is just the, the sky is just a matte gray, and you can't really say that's where the storm is. And that's when you have to you know, be aware of the forecast and be able to check on radar. the conditions yeah. and yeah. check on the radar. Yeah. And one of my telltale signs is when I'm out there, I can you can see storms coming in, and if it's just that nice green color, yeah. there have been a couple of those. I'm like, we got to get back. They're yeah. like, why? Because we were up in the monument over at Council Bluffs, and I saw this green thing over the horizon. I said, we got to get back. And we just pulled in, but we were out of it. It just rain, hail. Yeah. 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 Green, green, hail. The, when you guys talk about the Europe, European model. <laughs> model. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The European model, the American model, the, the, yeah, all the different computer models. Yeah. Those are satellite, right? Those are just super, super computers. Super computers. Yeah, super computers. yeah okay. algorithm supercomputers that are running and crunching all the data. There's okay. Euro European is in Germany, I think, then. then GFS is housed in Virginia. Uh, mm. The Global Forecast System is what it's called. The the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, the ENC, ECMWF, is the Euro, the European model. Um, so sometimes they're radically different. Yes, yeah, they are. Um, is one more accurate than the other, or is it yes, just no. depending? Or is it... Some some people claim one model is more accurate than the other, but they, they 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 all have their their like days. The weather channel every time we get a big storm, we see one plane. Going so it's like, <laughs> so it's like tubeless Jim and yeah. Cantor. 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 Yeah. Thank you very much. So this is what this this is my forecast page. This is what I go to when I start building the forecast. Yikes. Yikes. Which one do you use? Do you use the American or the European? So or both. So the best method is to look at all of them. And then see what the commonality is. See see what the difference is, is see what the similarities are, see what the trends have been. And then there, there's something called the national blend of models, which takes all those together and gets you an average. And they've been kind of experimenting with, with that and, and it kind of gives you a, a better starting point. So it's not necessarily going to be an accurate forecast, but it gives you a good starting point. So you wind it down to two and then grab a quarter? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm looking at the secret right now. So this is one of my favorite charts right here. Oh, it's kind of weird. But what this is is each line is a one run of the computer model. Each column is a day. So you can see 
as each run comes in what the trend has been. So for a while it looked like Thursday was going to be in the 70s and then the most recent computer model runs said, no, oh, never mind, it's going to be in the 50s. So we've had to trend that forecast for Thursday downward and downward and downward because it initially was coming in with 70s in the computer model and then it went down in the 50s. Wow. That's kind of like Crane Trust two weeks ago. It was supposed to be 60s. Yeah. 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 Got, to the, got to the 20s in the morning <laughs> and snow. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.